From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And coming up today, K-State's Sandy Johnson on managing late harvested forages that received excessive moisture this past fall, oftentimes resulting in mold development. She'll look at feeding adjustments with moldy forages to avert toxicity problems and at how that moisture may have impacted the nutrient content of that forage. From the latest Cattle Chat podcast out of the Beef Cattle Institute at K-State, then Brad White, Bob Larson, and Dustin Pendle address a variety of topics, including changes in antibiotic use in the cattle industry. And standing by for this week's K-State horticulture segment, Ward Upham on starting vegetable garden transplants from seed. It's all next on Agriculture Today. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State research and extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans and more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today. Glad to have you aboard once again. Well, because of uncooperative weather this past fall, quite a few of our forage stands in Kansas were harvested late. And that might, in turn, have brought to bear some concerns about mold development in those forages. And, in fact, there are more than a few producers, we're told, encountering that mold as they feed those forages or attempt to do so. We've brought in, once again, via phone, Sandy Johnson. Sandy is a livestock specialist, K-State Research and Extension, based in northwest Kansas. And we'll talk about the consequences of moldy, late-harvested forage. The frequency of this problem, though, Sandy, are you hearing from producers quite a bit about this? Well, I just know that in my travels around the area, you know, really what happened is people laid down this uh, forage, you know, in hopes to putting it up in a week or so, and it was two months later before they could even think about having dry enough to go into a bale. And so it was well rinsed um, (laughs) with both rain and snow, before it uh, got dry enough to bale. And in fact, I know of a few that said, well, maybe we'll just try and graze what's there and let them pick through it. Are any particular forages more predisposed to mold development than others? Um, I, I don't know that there's necessarily differences between the development of mold. But what I do know is if there is for example, uh, something with carbohydrates like silage or corn, where you have uh, really an energy source, then it's more likely to develop the mycotoxins, and it's really the mycotoxins that generally cause performance issues and other concerns in our animals. So from the standpoint of some of our forage sorghum in that family that was a lot of what we saw a problem with this fall out here in northwest Kansas at least, we're less likely to see the mycotoxins because of the lack of of carbohydrates there. So that part is good, but it can still have a lot of mold on it and certainly looks unappealing from my standpoint. And I would have to think that animals would find it very unpalatable as well. But, and you make this point in an article on this topic in the Beef Tips newsletter recently, mold doesn't necessarily mean that mycotoxins are present. Right, right. And and that's kind of the frustrating thing is, you know, so I have this forage that I could clearly see mold there. And, you know, Sandy says if there's not any carbohydrates, it shouldn't develop into mycotoxins, but I can't promise that it won't, it's less likely, then there's other cases where we we might not see evidence of mold, but yet mycotoxins are produced when we end up troubleshooting the whole thing. So really kind of a frustrating, uh, no clear answer, can't check to be sure that everything is free and clear. And the implications of cattle ingesting mold-infected forage, what are those? Well, I think if we're trying to provide 
something like this in a free choice bail, we're going to find that they're going to be pretty uh, reluctant and complain about eating that. Mm -hmm. If we were offering something really moldy to some pregnant cows, we might get concerned that we could cause some abortions there. And in the case then of, of the abortions related to the mold, in this case, it's the mold dust that they end up inhaling and it can actually find its way into the fetal tissues that causes the abortion. And so that's slightly different than when we're talking about the production of mycotoxins. And so if we need to feed some of this to pregnant cows, we ought to really be looking at how we can dilute it and probably grind to dilute it. Setting out one bale of good stuff and one bale of bad stuff isn't going to work very well because the big cows are going to have the good feed and the little cows are going to have the lousy feed. And so we'd need to mix it to try and deal with it. Now, we can feed it to other non-pregnant animals. We would certainly want to not wean calves off on that. We've got uh, palatability issues there, but could begin working that into little older growing calves. And again, dilution is really the solution to using this. The unfortunate part is that we, we produced a lot of this forage out here this year I can't speak for what everybody has to dilute it with, but, but that'll be our challenge. And there is another side to this issue. We'll bring that up in a second. But before we leave the topic of mycotoxins, is it worthwhile for a producer to test for those? Well, you know, that's always a frustrating on the forage side. It's probably going to have to do with what your risk tolerance is and what you want to know about what's there. Mm-hmm. You can get a simple mold count or you can do more of a screening. And the challenge with getting them tested is that you need a very representative sample because it's not like they're consistent throughout the forage. And so if you're really risk adverse and you want to really confirm what is or isn't there, just make sure that you do a really, really thorough job of sampling then you'll have some more information. Now, you're probably still back in the same position that, you know, they'll say that you'll have a high mold count, high yeast count, and what are you going to do with it? And Mm -hmm. the silage is more likely to show signs of the mycotoxins or if for some reason you had a lot of grain in what you were sampling. But a very unpalatable answer for me to give. (laughs) It's a judgment Um, call in the end. Yes. Yes, it kind of has to do with your risk aversion and how how you might use it. But we can visit with individuals on that more as their particular situation arises. The other consideration then is, is there an impact on the nutrient availability that this mold might bring to bear? Well, the mold does not impact the nutrient uh, availability as much as what happened with all the moisture that came down on it while while it was trying to dry. Mm-hmm. And the timing of that moisture, did it happen before it started to dry down at all? Was it almost ready to bale and then it got moisture? And I'm sure we had people in all those categories, really. But we start to leach nutrients out of there as that gets various rain and moisture events as it's trying to dry. Uh, largely, that's the really soluble energy. You just think of kind of washing sugar away out of that as it rains down on it. doesn't necessarily impact protein, but what can happen is if we like, all right, it's not perfectly dry, but this may be as dry as I'm going to get because we don't get any 100-degree days in, in November to dry it out. So then you get some heating in the bale and you can get heat damage protein. So that would be something we would want to test for in our nutrient analysis to see if there is indeed heat damage protein and that becomes unavailable to the animal. And so we may need a little more protein supplement to account for that lower amount of available protein. And then, you know, the other thing is the overall energy in the forage would reflect the carbohydrates that were washed out of it. We would want to make sure to get a TDN measurement or some kind of net energy value on that forage 
because it may be much lower than what we're used to having, and so we might need to adapt our supplementation procedure in order to get enough energy to whatever we're feeding compared to what we might be normally used to. So by the sound of it, a nutrient analysis is strongly recommended here. Yes, and I guess we always want producers to test their forage and balance the ration, but it's going to be even more critical when you have a forage that has had a lot of exposure to moisture to see what's really there. One final thing here, Sandy, again covered in the Beef Tips newsletter article. We've quite some grazing residue yet, and that may be opening up now and available. Back to the mold consideration here. Is there a concern? Yeah, you know, I just noticed that my dogs tend to bring in corn out of the field, and (laughs) there's a nice moldy piece they brought in, and I don't know what the mold does to my dogs, but you certainly do see some mold out here in in our, our grain. And I guess the good thing generally is they don't tend to get enough of that in a crop residue grazing situation that it generally causes problems. But if for some reason there was a lot of grain down and a lot of evidence of either visible mold or you knew that there was a lot of stress that might be concerned about uh, various mycotoxins, Oh, then you might think about testing something, but it would be really tough to do. Generally, we don't have a problem with what we see in those uh, crop residue fields, but, you know, do be aware uh, that in some extreme situation, it could be a problem. Well, we hope that we've caused producers to at least give a second thought to what's happening with these forages, either harvested or standing in the field as a residue. And there is this write-up that you put together on the topic, Management of Mold and Quality Issues in Late Harvested Forage. It's in the Beef Tips newsletter series, which one can find at ksubeef.org, posted here at the first of this new year. So, Producers, have a look at ksubeef.org. Sandy, we appreciate the comments. Thank you. Glad to be here. Livestock Specialist Sandy Johnson of K-State Research and Extension on this part of agriculture today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. Next up on Agriculture Today, highlights from yet another Cattle Chat podcast out of the Beef Cattle Institute here at K-State. The BCI team gets together every week to exchange thoughts on timely matters in beef cattle production and management. Aboard this time around, veterinarians Brad White and Bob Larson and livestock economist Dustin Pendle. And handing it on over now to Brad. Today, we're going to discuss cow nutrition and we'll talk some about the decline in antibiotic usage. Bob, one of the things you saw in the in the news was talking about antibiotics, and I think several of us saw that. And, and, and we saw uh, FDA announce a, about a third decrease in antibiotic sales or usage. Or that, tell tell really us a little bit about that. So there was an announcement this week from the FDA saying that the, the amount of antibiotics sold for use in livestock species was down by a third. And so that's really all they track very well is just so, – and so you never know exactly between use because of stockpiling and different things like that. But in general, I think what they're saying this is – This was based on volume. Volume sold. So not, not broken down by exact type of antibiotic or anything like that. And so there's probably a lot more interesting things in the details. But I think the reality and what they were saying is you know, we've had the veterinary feed directive out for a year. And has it, has it impacted the amount of antibiotic used? And, and the answer is probably that's a big driver of this drop. And I think the opportunity there is, I think one of the things that came about because of the veterinary feed directive was uh, increased conversations between uh, producers and veterinarians identifying, well, when, it, when is it really worth the trouble of getting a veterinary feed directive? And, and sometimes uh, the answer was, well, this may be one of those situations where it's, eh, it's not that much helpful not that helpful, maybe not worth 
going through that hassle. And so that's where some of the reduction comes from is, is just identifying those areas where maybe you don't get as much bang for your buck anyway. And we were kind of using those tools just out of habit versus real thoughtful consideration of when we get the most bang for our buck. And, and I think that reduction, and we, we hear more and more about being sure that we're strategic with those antimicrobials. This is, this is part of that process. Right? I, I and you hope right. to see this type of change. Yeah. Dustin, does that do you see that from a, any economic perspective on that? Is that something that impacts our supply, demand? How does that impact our, our production of beef if we reduce antimicrobial use? Well, I guess I'd have to dig a little deeper and read, but I guess my initial thought, if, if, if we were using it more of a precautionary as opposed to when we need it, I don't know if it does have a big impact now if it's... Yeah. If yeah. it truly changes the risk, then that might be something. Right. And so I guess my initial thought is if, if we did decline by a third and, and, there's, it, no effect. and there's no effect, then no, it's probably a, in the long run it's going to be better off not and only for the producer but also It seems good on about, the surface, but you, but you have to evaluate the whole system, right? Yeah. Where are those impacts? And those impacts may or may not be felt in the, in the short term or the long term. It could be positive seems to be on the surface. Yeah. I well, I, my initial thought was, okay, why is this? When I read the headline earlier, I said, okay, is it, you know, is it that uh, veterinary feed directive, which I assumed it probably was. But then I also started thinking, well, you know, we see this in the news all the time. Well, that's true. And so is it something from the, the retail or the food sector that's pushing this down also? Could that be driving because, or ultimately the consumer? And yeah. I didn't know if maybe we've, there's... We've had a couple quick service restaurants in the last two weeks yeah. come out with statements on antimicrobial use and and many of us have speculated that antimicrobial use and how we use it may not be a regulatory issue but it may be a customer exactly issue. How, do, how do we yes. handle that yeah. which could be a lot of other things that we've talked about on the past whether it's traceability or, or who knows yeah. what it may be coming that way versus true regulatory right problem. yeah so we wanted to do our bci cattle chat checklist today so we put together 10 New Year's resolutions that we'd like to have for next year and spend a little time debating what they should be and what should be on the list and what shouldn't. But I'd like to go around and, and Bob, you start out. What's your what's your first New Year's? And these are resolutions for us as producers, right. things we want to do in, in the next year. Okay, I'm going to say increase my oversight of bulls. And it's because reproductive efficiency is really important to me. And, and bull efficiency, health, so breeding soundness exams of the bulls, just good, making sure those bulls are out there doing their job because they are awfully important for reproductive efficiency. Dustin? So the first one that came to my mind was as someone who likes data, likes to help people make better decisions, that was uh, keep better records, mm-hmm. you know, from a, preferably an individual animal. And it's not just production. Yeah, it can be production, it can be reproduction, but also some of the, the economics of finances, that kind of stuff. First one to my mind was less days of hay feeding. Thankfully, I work with academicians who were able to tell me that I can't have less days of hay feeding. I should have fewer days of hay feeding. So <laughs> once, we, once we got to that point. But I, but I want to have less days of, of harvested forage so feeding. Basically stretching our, our grazing fewer, days. I want to have fewer days of harvested forage yeah, More feeding. grazing days. How about uh, troubleshooting my handling facilities? What I'm thinking there is uh, almost everybody could uh, has something that they know is not quite right in their facilities. You know, it might be a head gate that hangs up or, or fences that need to be fixed or a gathering area. But my, my New Year's resolution is to identify and, and fix the, the thing that's bugging me the most about my facilities. We, we interviewed a candidate for a position the other day at the vet school. They, they were going to do field service, and they said one of the most important things that they have with them when they're going out working cattle as a veterinarian was tape measure, which, of course, leads to the question, why do you have a tape measure? And, and they were using it to measure some of the alleyways, measure some of the widths, because often we eyeball it and say, yeah, that'll work. And we build some facilities that – I've built facilities before that are one size fits none. So <laughs> big enough for the big enough for the bull and way too big for the calves and and so you don't really have a happy medium. So that I think it's a great time to give it a walk through and back to that when the cortisol is lower, give it a walk through when you don't have to work cattle that day cuz typically when I think about making adjustments is when the first cow is in the yeah. <laughs> that's right uh. yeah might want to adjust it. So I guess back to me thinking about 
going back to my graduate school days when I was, which is a long time ago, I was working on traceability. Mm-hmm. Traceability has been brought up quite a bit in recent weeks, months, uh, so, and then also being involved in cattle trace, being able to participate in, in that. That's so, a good New Year's resolution. So maybe participate in cattle trace. Yep. Get involved. Be part of the process. And the last last one on our list, increase our increase our expert network. And I think all of us have a network of people that we go to and ask questions, and, and whether it's a nutrition question or your genetics or whatever the question is, have that person you go to and, and ask a question. And, and establishing those relationships makes it way easier. I think that's really important. And, and a lot of times we're talking about relatively local. So uh, veterinary practitioners, nutritionists, extension specialists, there's a lot, a lot of times banker, finance people. There's a lot of expertise in our local communities and in the vicinity that I, I want more of that. I want more good information. And so those are our New Year's resolutions for, for 2019. And as we look at things in the news and, and a couple of different items that have, that have been in the news related to exports, Dustin and Bob, what, what do you guys see in the news? Well, so I just noticed, I don't know if it's today or yesterday, but a, a study that came out by WPI World Perspectives Incorporated, which was the same uh, consulting firm that did the uh, traceability for NCBA. Uh, they updated a study, I believe it was back in 2015, to where they were looking at pork and beef exports, looking at the impact to the corn industry. And it equates to almost 460 million bushels of corn, uh, which is Substantial. So, all, so you're talking about we, we export corn, so there's a value in the direct corn exports, and there's value in the direct beef exports, but there's actually value to the corn producers for the meat exports. Correct. In addition yes. to just what in the corn addition is to being and exported. and we said it's 460 million bushels, but what that translates to it says it's about 11 percent of the corn price this year is derived from red meat exports. Mm. Thank so you. the indirect impact to the corn industry is is that 11% increase in price, price because is, of the red meat. Which is about $0.39 cents per bushel is what the study said. Wow. I, I just, that, that matters. Because when we talk, and we've talked on this show a couple times, exports are not individual animals or individual carcasses primarily. They're pieces and parts of lots of them. So when we look at our export market, it impacts almost everybody. And we said last time on feeder calves, similar to the – did the math for the corn, but similar on feeder calves, it helps the price Correct. across the board. Right. So it's not just the beef industry, it's all the allied industries, whether it's pork or hay or et cetera. Absolutely. Last thing we wanted to touch on, anything I should think about changing on my cows, so I've got spring calving cows, they're third trimester, they're currently grazing milo stalks, dormant forage, corn stalks. Well, in this part of the world around this part of Kansas, there'd be a lot of cows that are spring calving, so they're late in gestation, so that calf is starting to pull pretty hard on the cow as far as energy and, and protein demands. And the forage that we've got is, for the most part, I mean, there are some cover crops or other crops that are green, but mostly you're talking about dormant forages, either stored hay or standing dormant forage or corn stalks or something like that. And so we're probably at our lowest nutrient quality of our forage at the time when we're really ramping up the nutrient demand of the cow. So this is an important time of year. Well, here's wishing you a great 2019 as we start into 2019. And we'll talk to you again next week. Brad White, Bob Larson, and Dustin Pendle of the Beef Cattle Institute here at K-State. Do take in the entire podcast. You'll find it at beefcattleinstitute.org. You're tuned to Agriculture Today. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128 plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. Agriculture Today continues here on the K-State Radio Network. Eric Atkinson with you, and on we go now to today's agricultural news headlines for you, courtesy in part of DTN. 
The U.S. Trade Representative's Office has wrapped up the latest round of trade talks in Beijing, saying that China has committed to buy more U.S. agricultural goods, energy, and manufactured items. The talks concluded after three days with a cautious sense of optimism that the two large economies might be able to reach a deal that ends the trade war, according to a report in Bloomberg. The USTR uh, Robert Lighthizer said that the two sides considered ways to achieve fairness, reciprocity, and balance in trade relations. In his words, the U.S. will decide on the next steps after officials report back to Washington. President Trump and Chinese President Xi Jinping have given their officials until March the 1st to reach an accord on key changes to China's economy on issues such as the forced transfer of American technology, intellectual property rights, and non-tariff barriers. The U.S. Trade Representative statement did not say whether progress has been achieved on those main concerns. Observers told Bloomberg that positions were closer on areas including energy and agriculture, but further apart on the harder issues. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Liu Kang said that a one-day extension in the talks showed that both sides are serious about the negotiations. Later this month, Lighthizer is expected to meet with Vice Premier Liu He, that's Xi's top economic aide who's leading the negotiations for China. Liu made a brief appearance at the talks in Beijing on Monday, boosting the optimism that China was serious about making progress on a deal. You producers who have waited to enroll in the market facilitation program will get that deadline extension once USDA Farm Service Agency offices are allowed to reopen. USDA Secretary Sonny Perdue announced yesterday that the department will extend the January 15th enrollment deadline for the payments and add a comparable number of days to set a new deadline when USDA funding is reauthorized by Congress and approved by the president. In a statement, the secretary said the extension would run for a number of days equal to the number of business days that the FSA offices remained closed during the shutdown. Uh, Farmers who have already applied for MFP and certified their 2018 production have continued to receive payments, according to Secretary Perdue. And the EPA and U.S. Army Corps of Engineers have postponed a scheduled January 23rd public hearing on the new Waters of the United States rule that to be held in Kansas City, Kansas, as a result of the ongoing partial government shutdown. That according to a news release posted to the EPA's website. In addition, the EPA said in the news release it's also postponed the publication of the proposed rule in the Federal Register until the shutdown has ended. The newly proposed WOTUS rule is set for finalization in September, depending on how long the shutdown continues and on whether an expected 60-day public comment period is extended at some point. The final rule may not be completed until the end of the year. Under the proposal, there would be just six categories of jurisdictional waters, including traditional navigable waters, tributaries, certain ditches that are navigable or affected by tide, lakes and ponds, impoundments and wetlands that abut or are connected to water of the U.S. The proposal lists waters that would not be regulated, including certain land features where water is present only as a result of heavy rainfalls, as well as groundwater. The federal government shutdown is causing some hardships and confusion for those in agriculture, and Todd Domer says it's led to misunderstanding of the rules for hauling livestock. Some news accounts have presented misinformation on the status of federal electronic logging device regulations for livestock haulers. For clarification, according to the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, during the government shutdown, transporters of livestock and insects are not required to have an electronic logging device, nor do they need to carry any documentation justifying the exemption. Some media misinterpreted the message from the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration to mean the exemption is permanent, which is not the case. The logging device exemption for livestock haulers will remain in effect until Congress moves forward on an extension of the temporary exemption found in the U.S. Department of Transportation budget for the great majority of the trips made by livestock haulers, Current electronic logging device and hours of service regulations do not allow enough drive time to accommodate the realities of transporting live animals across the country. Research also demonstrates repeated loading and unloading harms the livestock and puts the hauler in danger. I'm Todd Domer. 
Now, this week's Kansas Soybean Update with Greg Akagi. Greg? Dennis Upi, Director of Field Services for Kansas Soybeans, joins us. And Dennis, the Kansas Soybean Commission and Kansas Soybean Association are going to be a part of this year's Kansas Commodity Classic as a new co-sponsor and co-host of the event on January 24th in Manhattan. Greg, we are looking forward to this. We have, of course, always had our own Soybean Expo, which is our annual meeting, but we feel very privileged that the other grain commodities, wheat, corn, and grain sorghum, saw fit to invite us to participate because it takes all of agriculture, all of the grain commodities working together, and this happens to be an event that we can work together to highlight Kansas agriculture. It will take place Thursday, January 24th at the K-State Alumni Center in in Manhattan, and it's a full program this year, too. With registration starting at 7.30 in the morning, and we'll kick it off at 8.30 with a welcome. But as usual, we have the political side of the meeting, which uh, the governor's office has been invited to participate. Senator Moran is scheduled to be there. And also Congressman Marshall will give his outlook as far as from the House side, his viewpoint weather, which is always going to be important. Now we're going to look here for the rest of winter into early spring. And soybeans can clearly relate to this because with the fall we've had, weather had become a very big player. But weather is important. The farmers always enjoy coming in, learning what the predictions are for the coming year. And so we look forward to that. And talk about the farm bill, or in this case, the implementation of the new farm bill, too. We are having a farm panel, which David Shim, FSA director, is going to uh, attend, and there will be others on the panel, but they're going to talk about what the benefits, what protections are in this farm bill for the Kansas farmers. Always have to talk about the markets, and uh, Matt Roberts will be doing that. Yes, he's coming in from Ohio, and we look forward to having him, because sometimes it's great to get a perspective from outside of Kansas on the world view of what's going on in the markets. People need to register because there will be a lunch that will be served. Well, it's always nice to have a count, and they can go to the KansasCommodityClassic.com website to do their registration. And so we hope that people will register. We know we and expect a big crowd because last year we were near capacity and we look forward to another large crowd. That is Dennis Hoopy, who is Director of Field Services for Kansas Soybeans, joins us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. Thanks, Greg. And this is Agriculture Today. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. This Agriculture Today comes to a close with our weekly K-State Horticulture segment for you now. And for you home gardeners who are just itching to do something, we're getting close to the time now where you can start those vegetable garden transplants indoors. And this requires a procedure that should be followed closely, as we'll cover today with our guest, K-State Research and Extension Horticulturist Ward Upham. January usually (laughs) doesn't provide much in the way of gardening atmosphere, but in the absence of that, one can start those transplants successfully what, in the next week or two? Yeah, if you're talking about onions, they need to be started really early. And since they're a cool season crop, they're set out early too. So we're talking, you know, mid to late January for starting them. But we're going to be talking about a number of crops so you can start early. And there's a lot of things you need to keep in mind. And so we have all this information available for you in our horticulture newsletter. So if you do a search on KSU Horticulture Newsletter, the first link that comes up should be our newsletter. And we only have one up so far this year, so it'll be easy to find all this information. So if you miss something as we talk about it, you can find it there. And we do recommend that strongly for within that article, there is a chart that tells you 
at what point you should start specific vegetables and then plan on taking them outdoors for planting. So it all revolves around that. Do check out that newsletter. But some of the guidelines, getting quality seed is the first and foremost thing. Yes, quality seed and also recommended seed. Some varieties that may do well in other parts of the country will not do well in Kansas. And so we have a um, publication that's available that we have a link to on our newsletter that shows you what KSU recommends. Now, there may be other varieties that would do well in your area as well. So talk to neighbors, talk to your garden center personnel, people like that that can make recommendations for what has done well for them. So if you've never gardened before, be sure you use recommended seed. If you have and you're growing a variety of different things, don't shy away from trying something new just to see if it does well for you. And is there some uh, secret to determining quality of seed? What you want to do is make sure that it was it's fresh seed. In other words, uh, it was packaged this year. And so if you buy a garden packet, look at that packet and see when it was packaged because sometimes it may have been packaged several years ago. Now, you can still use older seed. It's just that the germination may be a little bit less. And we do have an article on what to look at uh, if you do use old garden seed. And the aforementioned newsletter, so have a glance at that as well. But when to seed, and again, that chart will give you more direct time intervals, but are there general guidelines to follow here? Yes. So what you're looking at is whether that crop is cool season or warm season. So if it's like cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, that's a cool season crop. Normally those go out in late March and early April. And then on our chart, we'll say how many weeks before then you actually have to seed in order to have that plant large enough to put outside on that date. And then we also have warm season plants such as tomatoes and peppers. And so also it gives you how many weeks ahead you need to plant those. For example, tomatoes is six weeks ahead. Peppers is eight weeks ahead. And it just varies on the crop, but that chart will give you all that information that you need. So line out your calendar accordingly on your starts. As far as growing transplants, though, the growing medium is critical here. It is. You don't want to use garden soil. Garden soil may carry diseases that you don't want, but it also doesn't breathe well. And those roots need oxygen just as much as they need water and therefore use a seeding mix that will be sterile as well as provide that aeration those plants need in order to get off to a good start. And preferably seeding in a flat that's made for transplants? That makes it a lot easier, Uh, not only because it's easy to plant those and uh, to keep them labeled, but also it's easy to keep them moist because you can cover it with something like a, a plastic wrap until they germinate. A lot easier to do that than it is to make sure that it's constantly moist by adding water. And so make sure you get your seed in, make sure it's constantly moist, and then just cover with plastic until it germinates. Uh, Makes it real easy. But that is one of the other essentials. That seed must be kept moist until germination. It really Constantly, right? Yes, it must. Now, if you just let it dry out a little, it may not kill the seed. It just slows down the germination. But once that seed comes up, then the needs change. You need to uncover it and give it as much light as possible. And so that may mean What you do is just put it in a south-facing window, but that may not be enough light. And in those cases, you're probably going to have to use artificial light, such as a fluorescent fixture. Now, in next week's newsletter, we'll have information, an actual video on how to make a very simple one out of PVC tube that will allow you to grow plants under lights. And... In my consideration, I think that's the best way to go. Mm -hmm. We usually just don't get enough light through that south-facing window to do a good job of growing these plants. Now, temperature is obviously important as well here. And and how does one regulate that to allow those transplants to emerge successfully? Now, there are seeding mats that will provide a gentle bottom heat that allows those seeds to come up a little bit earlier. Usually what you're looking for is a temperature about 70, yeah, about 70 degrees for most of our plants in the medium. But if you don't have that, if you can get those plants a little bit closer to the uh, ceiling, that's warmer air up there. And so on the top of the refrigerator will often work well. 
that will give you a little bit warmer temperature to get those seeds germinated. Now, once they start growing, you want to cool them down a little bit. If you could do it, what you'd want is probably somewhere around 60 degrees. But get as close to that as you can, and that'll make sure that that growth is still there and it's still significant, but it's slow enough those plants don't get spindly. So that 60 degree is a maintenance range for these transplants. That's right. Effect. That's a grow-on range, yes. All right. And here's a step that most folks don't think about, actually, and that is those plants may need some physical stimulation, so to speak. They actually will be stockier and shorter if you run your hand across the top of them about 10 times in the morning, 10 times in the evening. They react to that movement. Since they're inside, they're not going to get much air. Outside, they get plenty of wind, and it just happens naturally. Inside, you don't get that. So just run your hand across the top of them 10 times in the morning, 10 times at night, and those plants will be stockier. Now, that's assuming you have enough light. If you don't have enough light, nothing you do is going to make them stocky. They're going to be spindly. So it all ties together. And by all means, have a look at the Horticulture Newsletter Edition posted this week, as a matter of fact, and it covers all of the specifics on starting garden vegetable transplants. You can simply search for K-State Horticulture Newsletter. Ward, thank you for coming over. You bet. He's a K-State horticulturist, is Ward Upham, with the basics on starting garden vegetables from seed via the transplant process on this week's K-State Horticulture segment. And thanks for being along with us today. Eric Atkinson here. This has been Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.